A series of votes are due in Europe this week. They're aimed, of course, at preventing a Greek default. European banks, though, they remain vulnerable, as do some of their U.S. counterparts, counterparty risk, for example. So let's get an investor's perspective. We've got Charles DeVoe. He is the chief investment officer at IVA Funds. Charles is a value investor managing $16 billion. Charles, always a pleasure. Thanks for coming in. Before Thank we you. talk about specific stocks and the value investors approach right now, what do you make of the situation in Europe and its relationship to investors in the United States? Is there a direct connection? Well, yes, in the sense that many, uh, some of the largest American companies are multinational companies, whether it's Coca-Cola, McDonald's, some of the banks have global businesses. And so whatever happens to Europe, uh, to its economy, to its currency, does matter to all of us, and including uh, American companies and investors. Do you think that there's going to be a recession in Europe? I don't know. Possibly uh, would make sense. Uh, more importantly, rather than what will happen next year, is our belief that for the next four, five, six years, the growth will be anemic no matter what. Slow growth in Europe, yes. and that affects U.S. companies here. Yes. What about the banking system? Is that able to withstand any of the potential crisis in Europe? No. The European banking system is notoriously undercapitalized. The stress test was a joke. And some of the policymakers, Mrs. Lagarde from the IMF, are starting to, Timothy Geithner the other day, are trying to tell the Europeans to get their act together and start to recapitalize those banks. Do you think that the European uh, policymakers will listen? <laughs> I would not bet on policymakers doing what's right, but I think the, uh, they are starting to hear the message, yes. So if they are starting to hear the message, would that begin with a recapitalization of banks in Europe? They've certainly got enough time to deal with their holdings of Ye Greek debt. Yes, and both the, in Germany and France, there's talk of uh, recapitalization of those sets of banks. Both the French and German banks are heavily exposed to Greece, and so there's an urgent need for those banks to be recapitalized to give confidence to, to the whole system. Now, as a value investor, I'm curious, have you been prospecting in Europe at all? Stock markets there have been tumbling. Well, yes. Yes and no, Pam. And I'm reminded of the old adage on Wall Street whereby it's during bear markets that you make money. It's just that you don't realize it at the time. So you should be expecting us to be pouncing and buying lots of things as indices have come down. The bad news is which is also good news, is that there's been a wonderful discrimination both in Europe and here between the good stocks, the, comp the stocks of good businesses, well capitalized, and those stocks have been very resilient. They have barely come down versus the other kinds of stocks, the cyclical companies, the under uh, capitalized banks that have taken a beating. So the stock that looks cheap remains unsafe. The good stuff has not come down enough for us to want to pounce. In fact, at the margin, we've uh, reduced a little bit our exposure to equities over the past month or so. Well, let's talk about the asset allocation mix right now in, the, in your funds. You used to have quite a bit of gold. Tell me what happened to those holdings. Well, you know, gold started to go uh, parabolic this summer. And uh, starting in the second, third week of August, we started to trim our allocation to gold from what was around 7.3% in our worldwide fund to slightly below 5%. How did you know that? How did you know to get out then? I mean, why didn't you not pick, let's say, oh, no. $2,000 no, an ounce? Because, I mean, no, I, I know nothing precisely. I'm trying to be humble. It's, it's simply as the price of gold goes up, I have to contain my, my, my uh, enthusiasm for it. And conversely, as stocks get cheaper, there's less of a need to buy gold. We own gold as an insurance policy. The cheaper stocks are worldwide, the less of a need to own that insurance policy called gold. So it's very logical, very easy, and takes a lot of the guesswork out of the equation. All right, so you moved from about a little bit more than 7% of the portfolio in gold to what, about 5%? A little less than 5 yes. And how much cash have you got on hand right well, now? The cash uh, has gone up from uh, around maybe 8 9% a few months ago to 13 14%. So we, we still have some dry powder. Um, in a way, the fact that the good stocks have not come down, the fact that the high yield market has not collapsed may be an encouraging sign. The market's decline has been very orderly in some ways, and that uh, could be uh, construed as, as, uh, as bullish and, and, and optimistic. Well, I'm going to get your thoughts on some specific stocks, but I'm wondering if this orderly decline that you described, are we going to see investors liquidate liquid assets, things that they can sell because things they can't sell 
are really not doing well. Well, yes, I mean, I have no idea what will happen tomorrow. It's possible. But, uh, you know, what's the alternative? Cash yielding 0% or minus in real terms, adjusted for inflation? 10-year treasuries yielding 1.9 or 2%? I think investors are smart enough to understand that some good companies that pay decent dividends offer yields that are generous enough to make it worth holding on to. And you've also got stock repurchases and increases in dividends. You had McDonald's as well as Microsoft even, last uh, week. Mr. Buffett. I was going to say, morning. Warren Buffett coming out today and yes. saying that he's going to repurchase shares of yeah. uh, Berkshire Hathaway. I, I like that better than the increasing taxes. So I'm speaking about the economic slowdown, perhaps, in Europe and its effect on investors. My guest is Charles DeVoe. He is the chief investment officer at IVA Funds. He's responsible for managing $16 billion. Charles, let's talk about some specifics. I want to begin with you and Japan. You still like stocks in Japan? Of course, Pim. The, Japan's been a bear market for 20 years. Stock prices have been decimated. And companies have now very strong balance sheets, loads of cash. And some companies are starting to pay attention to their shareholders more than others. And we have found a few companies that are very safe, very non-cyclical, and offer uh, high dividend yields. All right, let's talk about some of them. I know one of them, Seicom, Seicom. S-E-C-O-M. This yes. is a security company in Japan. Yeah, but electronic security, yeah. like ADT, as opposed to security guards, right. which is a good business, a big economies of scale. They have you like the recurring revenue stream. And huge uh, profit margin because of their scale. And uh, the stock trades at a very low multiple. Maybe the company's punished because in, a long time ago they diversified, they, they made a few uh, little uh, foolish acquisitions, but they've, they seem to be acting better. The dividend yield is 2.5%, which you know, is 2.5 times more than what the 10-year tre treasuries yield in Japan, and, and it's just cheap. All right, so you like Seicom. Tell me about also Estellas Pharmaceuticals. Cash on the balance sheet. Lots of cash. Uh, around 25% of the market cap is represented by net cash. You, you strip that out from the market cap, you're paying six times operating income for the business. And the, operating in, the, the dividend yield is 4.4%. And the company, over the past six, seven years, has bought back almost 20% of its shares outstanding back for the right reason, because they understand that the more they can retire the shares at a discount, the more accredited it is for remaining shareholders. All right, so how have you maintained your discipline over this period in Japan? Because it hasn't been a straight ride in any direction. No, well, straight ride, precisely volatility has been high in Japan, which makes it easier for us. It's easier to buy low, sell high when you have volatility. And the second point is that stock picking in Japan makes a huge difference. With over the past eight years, but also over the past two years, even year to date, our stocks in Japan have performed so much better than the average Japanese stock. So stock picking is key, especially in Japan. Talk a little bit more about this idea of stock picking, that it's a market of stocks, not a stock market. Do you think too many investors, they focus on the headlines having to do with either the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones Industrial Average, and they look at those numbers and then they measure their own performance and they're always chasing? Absolutely. And speaking about the S&P 500, in 1999, when the S&P was up sharply, there were more stocks going down on the New York Stock Exchange than up. And so when the tech bubble burst in March of 2000, we had a bifurcated market in the U.S. where small stocks were very cheap, while large cap growth and tech stocks were very expensive. Today in the U.S., it's the opposite. Large cap quality stocks, Walmart, Johnson & Johnson, Coca-Cola, many of these names, we don't own all of them, but many of these names have never been that cheap compared to small and mid-cap stocks in the U.S. So yes, stock picking makes a big difference. And I told, we talked about earlier how the, in Europe, the market has discriminated between the bad stuff that has come down a lot and the good stuff that has been very resilient. So yes, stock picking is alive and kicking. All right, so if it's alive and kicking, do you think that more and more investors will change the way that they look at investing? I mean, hopefully, but then stock picking is not e easy. You got to execute and it gets uh, tough out there on the battlefield. So ideally they should, but only if they know what they're doing. Tell me about what the credit markets are saying right now. I was talking earlier with some investment managers and they said, you know, you have one mindset in the credit markets. They think the world is going to end and the equity market doesn't seem to have caught up. I don't agree quite. Yes, uh, spreads have widened a lot over the past month or two in high yield corporates and a few other 
but nothing, nothing close to what happened in the fall of 08. We don't have any panic. We, I mean, here and there we're finding a cheap high-yield corporate bond to, to buy, but it's, it's not easy. So I, I, I think that credit markets remain very, um, I would say confident, but uh, are not uh, discounting gloom and doom. So hence the 15% that you've got in cash because you're waiting for those opportunities. No. In fact, I, I, I admit that the bond markets may be right. Maybe there's no, uh, there's no need for gloom and doom, but I, there are too many uh, moving parts. I don't want to bet the farm. So I'm holding cash despite the fact that the bond market, which is filled by a bunch of nervous Nellies like me, seems uh, somewhat comfortable. So where else would you be looking right now in, uh, in the stock market? Would you be looking, for example, at materials? We've seen a big decline in metals prices. Uh, yes, uh, we're starting to look, but then, we, uh, then again, we believe that some of these uh, commodities remain overpriced, whether it's copper, iron ore, but it's time to look. What's going on, some of the stocks may, are pricing in less than, than the current commodity prices. So I think one has to start doing the homework, but my hunch is that it's a tad too early. The area where we are very comfortable is uh, oil and gas. Oil and gas? Yes, yeah, so whether it's a Total, a Devon Energy. Uh, and I gather you like to get paid to wait. And in the case of Total, we get paid nicely while waiting, yes. I want to thank you very much, as always. Charles DeVoe joining us from IVA. He's responsible for $16 billion worth of assets. Thank you.